Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Good afternoon all of you. My subject is insurance law. I will deliver lectures on that. And uh, this is my third lecture, which is about the concept of life insurance. I'm Dr. Naresh Mahipal from uh, Faculty of Law, University of Delhi. In our previous lectures, that is lecture number one, we have discussed about the natures and functions of insurance law. And in second lecture, we have discussed about the historical development of insurance law, that how insurance grew, whether it may be marine insurance, maybe it is your general insurance, how it grew in the global context and thereafter we have discussed about the Indian context also. Now in this third topic, we will discuss about the concept of life insurance. While discussing the concept of life insurance, we will discuss about the scope of insurance. Thereafter, we will discuss about the kinds of legal insurance, kinds of life insurance and how the life insurance contracts are formed. That is about the formation of life insurance contract. To start with concept of life insurance, that what is life insurance? I would like to say that in our day to day life, we all anticipate various kinds of risks. No one can foresee or accurately predict the loss he may suffer in future. There can be loss due to floods, earthquakes, disease, fire, etc. Wherever there is uncertainty to a probable loss, there is a risk of loss. A person exposed to some risk may incur a loss. If it is small, he may bear it. But if it is large, he may not be in a position to bear it at its own. Hence, it would be wise to adopt a device or plan to provide help to those who suffer a loss. Such a device is known as insurance, which safeguards a person from various risks which he anticipates. An insurance policy holder and an insurer enters into a contract for life insurance under which the insurer agrees to pay a certain amount of premium upon the insured's death or after a predetermined amount of time in exchange for the policyholder's premium payments. When you purchase a life insurance policy, the life insurance company offers you a complete life coverage in exchange for premium payments made during the policy's designated terms. If an unfavorable occurrence happens, in that situation, life insurance protects your loved ones future by providing a lump sum payment known as death benefit. After the policy term expires, certain life insurance policies offer you a maturity benefit. If the insured person survives, you will get the maturity benefit of that. An insurance policy holder and an insurer enters into a contract for life insurance under which the insurer, that is the company, agrees to pay a certain amount of to the beneficiary upon the insured's death or after a predetermined amount of time in exchange for the policyholder's premium payments. To put it briefly, all of the advantages of a life insurance policy depend on the premium being paid. Thus, it is best to choose a rate that is manageable. Only after all premiums have been paid on time by the insured does a life insurance policy functions. 
So it is very important to keep intact with the position of your insurance payments and always try to get that policy for of which premium you can pay it. that is manageable by you. The life insurance is typically only offered for a certain amount of time. Therefore, the life insurance company is required to pay a death benefit commonly known as the sum assured if you pass away during this time. However, depending on the various type of life insurance policies, you can receive a maturity benefit if you live through the term also. Let us make it clear one more example with the one example from XYZ life insurance company, Mr. Ankit purchased a life insurance policy. The total assured under the 20 year insurance is rupees 20 lakh and the premium payment term is equal to the policy term with an annual premium of rupees 25,000. Now, if Mr. Ankit lives out the policy's duration, the guaranteed amount that is your rupees 10 lakh will also be paid as a maturity benefit. This is how Mr. Ankit's life insurance policy will function. The first situation is Mr. Ankit complete down policy terms. He has paid the life insurance premium of rupees 5 lakhs obviously for the 10 years. He will get a rupees 10 lakh maturity benefit plus any applicable bonuses. After the maturity benefit is paid, the policy will expire. Should have Mr. Ankit passed away during the 10th policy year, in that situation, he has paid premiums for the life insurance totaling rupees 2.5 lakhs. In the 10th policy year, his nominees will get a total of rupees 10 lakhs plus any relevant bonuses. After the death benefit is paid, the policy will expire. If Mr. Ankit selected premium protection when purchasing the insurance, the following will happen when he passes away in the 10th year. The policy will be paid to his family the standard death benefit of rupees 10 lakhs in the 10th policy year. The policy will keep growing in value and he will at the conclusion of the 20 year policy term pay the assured maturity value of rupees 10 lakhs plus any applicable bonuses. So this is something about the life insurance and while discussing this uh, concept of insurance law, it is uh, we cannot ignore the scope of insurance that what is the scope of insurance. The benefits are listed below to define the overall scope of life insurance. The first benefit that is the scope of life insurance is it secures your family's goal as the primary earner of the family. Plenty of responsibilities lie on your shoulders. If something unfortunate happens to you, the death benefit received by your family will help them sustain a comfortable lifestyle, at least a basic lifestyle. Thus, opting for adequate life insurance coverage, choosing a suitable sum assured is essential for the family's security. So, it's the first benefit of the insurance taking the life insurance that it secures your family's goal. The second benefit is it protects the children's future. You work hard to provide the best of everything for your children. A life insurance plan allows you to secure the dreams and aspirations of your child even if you are no longer around. The policy would continue as per original schedule and the maturity benefits would be provided to the child as defined. This would help to fund the child's education without any financial rules. Another benefit of this uh, policy is that it takes care of your liabilities. The various loans and liabilities that you take to make your life comfortable may become burdensome for your family in your absence. You have taken different kinds of loans, car loans and your other assets loans, different type of loans that will become a burden over your family if you are no longer around. Thus, most high value loans such as home loans are usually coupled with loan protection insurance plans. Another benefit of taking loan insurance is that with an annuity based plan or other saving schemes, 
you can enjoy the dual benefits of insurance as well as wealth creation. Thus, insurance could be easily combined with the family's financial plan. So, this is how you can gear up for the future by taking those policies where it will act as an investment plan. After the maturity, you will get the benefits as well as the sum that you have already deposited in the insurance plans. Another benefit of uh, this uh, insurance is that about the tax benefits. Yet another major benefit that you can avail of is tax saving. You can get tax benefits of up to rupees 150,000 on the premium that you pay towards the insurance policy as per section 80C of the Income Tax Act. Also, the death or the maturity benefits received by your nominee would be tax free under section 10. 10D of the IT Act. So, this is the scope of insurance law that we have discussed that there are many benefits that you can get after getting yourself insured. Now, coming to the kinds of life insurance. See, the life insurance is intangible. That is, no one can feel or see it. We cannot see the insurance policy. In modern times, throughout the world, the life insurance policies fall under the five important kinds. There are five types of insurance policies. Number one, term insurance policy. Number two, whole life policy. Number three, endowment policy. Number four, money back policy and annuities and pension. To mention two more other than these fives, those are children insurance policy and retirement benefits. Let us discuss it one by one that what are these type of policies are. Number one, it is about the term insurance policy. What is that? A term insurance policy is a pure risk cover for a specified period of time. In general terms, it means that the sum assured is payable only if the policy holder dies within the policy term. For example, let us take an example. If a person buys rupees 10 lakh policy for a term of 10 years, his nominee or beneficiary is entitled to the money if he dies within the 10 years period only. Second policy, popular policy is whole life policy. Whole life policy is another different insurance cover against the death irrespective of when it occurs. Under this plan, the policy holder pays regular premiums until his death, following which the money is handed over to the legal representatives. This policy, however, fails to address the additional needs of the insured during his post-retirement years. It doesn't take into account a person's increasing needs either. Next comes your endowment life policy. It is a combination of risk cover and financial savings. Endowment policies are the most popular policies in the world of life insurance. In an endowment policy, the sum assured is payable even if the insured survives the policy term. If you have taken the policy for 10 or 20 years, even if you survive after 20 years, you will get all the benefits of the insurance policy that you have been covered for that. If the insured dies during the tenure of the policy, the insurance firm has to pay the sum assured just as any other pure risk cover. The cost of such a policy is slightly higher but worth its value. The most famous we can say most popular type of policy in the world. Fourth type of policy nowadays that we see in the prevalence is that money back policy. These policies are structured to provide sums required as anticipated expenses such as marriage, education of children, etc. over a stipulated period of time. With inflation becoming a big issue, companies have realized that sometimes the money value of the policy is eroded. A portion of the sum assured is payable at regular intervals. The policy is so much uh, made as per your needs that when your son or daughter is about the marriage age, you will get a particular amount of the policy 
and uh, in the case of their education, you will get a portion of your policy amount at that time. So, on survival, the remainder of the sum assured is payable. In case of death, the full sum assured is payable to the insured nominees. Type of fifth kind of insurance policy is in an annuity, the insurer agrees to pay the insured a stipulated sum of money periodically. The purpose of an annuity is to protect against risk as well as to provide money in the form of pension at regular intervals. Over the year, insurers have added various features to basic insurance policies in order to address specific needs of a cross section of people. Sixth type of policy is children insurance policy. Child insurance plans are essentially life insurance policies that you purchase to protect your child's future. It assists in creating an education fund to support your child's goal and desires in addition to provide life insurance. Child plans let you build wealth for your child's future needs by combining insurance and investments. To create a solid financial cushion, you can start investing in these plans as soon as your child is born. And the last one is about your retirement plans. You can enjoy your post-retirement benefits by using these life insurance policies to help you accumulate a retirement corpus. You can designate your spouse as the beneficiary of your policy. Thus, they can be financially independent in the event that something were happened to you. Additionally, getting the finest life insurance policy will assist you in covering retirement related medical costs. So, these are certain type of uh, life insurance policies. Now, how the life insurance contracts are formed? This is basically we want to discuss that what are the factors that involves to form a life insurance contract. There are certain principles upon the basis which the life insurance contracts are formed. There are certain obligations on both sides by way of principles. These are certain. We will discuss it one by one. The very first is fundamental principles. There are certain fundamental principles which are to be followed while forming the life insurance contract. Obviously, life insurance contract is a contract. There are certain fundamental principles of contract under section 2H and section 10 of the Indian Contract Act 1872 that they are applied to all kinds of contracts. Because we know that insurance policy, it is a contract between the insured and ins insurer. So, the law of contract applies over that. The sections, the application of contract law is applicable over the insurance contracts also. And these are the fundamental principles. These principles are number one, agreement that there is offer and there is a acceptance. Another one is competency or capacity to contract. The third fundamental principle is free consent. The fourth is legal consideration and the fifth one is lawful object. So, these are five principles on the basis of which an insurance contract is uh, constituted it is defined and these are called the fundamental principles. Let us discuss it one by one. The very first one is agreement that is the offer and acceptance. Like all other contracts, a contract of life insurance is also concluded through offer and acceptance. The people who wish to get insured intend to buy the policy and that person makes the offer and the other party who is ready to assume the risk that is the insurance company is the acceptance. So, a person makes the offer and the company accepts it then it becomes a agreement. In case of life insurance, offer is called as proposal. If life insurance companies accept the proposal, it is converted into an agreement and binding over the both parties. A contract is a legally enforceable agreement whereas 
an agreement is a broad term used to convey an understanding between two or more people. To put it different way, we can say that not all agreements are contracts, but all contracts are agreements. Clear and second framework that outlines the terms and conditions of a deal between two or more parties is known as an agreement in the business sector. Example of such framework includes number one, the works scope that is the goods or services to be provided. Number two, the delivery schedule and method. Number three, each party's responsibilities including the term of payment. Number four, the term of termination. In order to ensure that everyone is aware of their roles and responsibilities and is able to carry out, agreements are required. Uh, let us discuss certain important landmark judgments regarding the agreement. In LIC versus Raja Vesaridi, 1984, the apex court, that is the Supreme Court, held that in the case of insurance proposal, silence does not denote consent and no binding contract arises until the person to whom an offer is made says or does something to signify his acceptance. Suppose you have made a proposal to the company and the company is silent over it. It doesn't mean the company has accepted your proposal and you have been issued a insurance policy. No. And in LIC versus Anamma 1999, again the court held that acceptance is complete only when it is communicated to the proposer. When the company accepts your proposal, it will communicate you through the policy papers. Mere silence after receipt and retention of premium cannot be construed as acceptance. If you have paid the premium and you have got a receipt, it doesn't mean that you, you have got a insurance. The company will send its acceptance by way of the policy. Only then you can say the agreement is complete and both parties are under the contract. In S.R. Kharadia versus Max New York Life Insurance Company Limited in 2009, Apex Court held that merely submission of proposal form along with the first installment of premium does not conclude the contract. The insurance company has to take certain steps to underwrite the risk and communicate that is communicated by way of insurance policy. The policy document is issued only thereafter it. So these are very important aspects about the offer and acceptance. Now second fundamental principle is competency or capacity to contract. The parties must be competent to enter into a contract. Every person is competent to a contract if who is of the age of majority according to the law to say 18 years adult person only that person can enter into a insurance contract. Secondly, who is of sound mind? Any insane person cannot enter into the insurance contract. And who is not disqualified from contracting by any law to which he is subject to. Means that should not be against the law. That policy term should not be against any law for the time being. However, a person who is not competent to contract can still be beneficiary of the contract with the help of provisions of section 11 of the contract act of 1872. To say a minor person who himself cannot enter into the contract, he can still be beneficiary of the insurance policy. In Great American Insurance Company versus Madan Lal Sonulal in the year 1935, it was contended by the insurance company that the person was minor on whose behalf the goods were insured. The court observed that the minor would be entitled to recover the insurance amount. This is the beneficiary aspect of the insurance policy. And in very famous you can say, landmark judgment related to the minor, we always discuss it in the life insurance or in the insurance law or when we teach the contract law. They, we cannot teach without this Mori BB versus Dharmodas Ghosh 539 PC. In this case, it was observed that a contract entered into by a minor himself is not only voidable but also void ab initio. 
that is from very inception from very beginning but a minor can enter into a contract through his parents or guardians such contract though binds the minor does not impose personal liability upon him this is very important aspect that a minor can enter into an insurance contract through his guardians or the parents a contracts beneficiaries may include minors it means that a minor can be a beneficiary of a contract even though he cannot enter into one a minor can benefit from the partnership form even though he is not permitted to become a partner according to section 30 of the indian partnership act 1932 for instance take an example and make it more clear rakesh asks amit his neighbor to mortgage his home as collateral when he gives him some money amit consents and sam rakesh 10 year old son is given preference in the mortgage deed sam's natural guardian rakesh launches a lawsuit against amit to reclaim the money after amit defaults on the loan since a minor can benefit from a contract the court has jurisdiction over the matter in this situation sam will get the benefit of that contract another important fundamental principle is that the person should be of sound mind what is about the sound mind a person is deemed to be of sound mind for the purpose of entering into a contract if in accordance with section 12 of the contract act he is able to comprehend the terms of the agreement and way how they would affect his interest he should be in a sane mind he should be in a legible position he should in a position to calculate his profit and losses this is what we call the person of sound mind it is significant to remember that an individual who is typically mentally unsound but can occasionally think well enough to enter into a contract can do so at any time even under transit situations no one who is not of sound mind may enter into a contract a person of unsound mind cannot enter into a contract and it is termed to be void contract another thing is about the disqualified persons who are disqualified to enter into the contract other than juveniles and mentally ill individuals some people are not allowed to sign contracts meaning that they lack the ability to contract political status legal status and other factors are among the grounds for disqualifications foreign ambassadors and sovereigns foreign enemies prisoners insolvents etc are a few examples of these people who are termed to be disqualified persons to enter into the insurance contract with us another important fundamental principle is free consent this is very important aspect when an offer and acceptance is made and an agreement is concluded free consent is very important aspect when both parties to contract agreed to and willing to abide by the terms and conditions of the contract in the same sense and spirit they are said to have a free consent where the consent is obtained through coercion fraud mistake undue influence misrepresentation etc about an essential fact the contract becomes voidable at the option of the party whose consent was so caused except fraud the contract would be void in case of fraud indian contract act 1872 it defines free consent under section 13 it says that free consent occurs when all parties to a contract agree on something in the some same sense consensus ad idem is the foundation of free consent in the absence of free consent the agreement is void let us take an example for that a proposed to b to buy his former house but b signed the deal because he believed a was willing to sell his new house however in this case the parties agreement is not mutually understood hence the contract is void so it is very essential that all parties to a contract agrees to the something in the same sense when all of the following conditions are met the parties consent is deemed to be free consent that is number 1 unfair influence should not be present during the contract 
it ought to be devoid of coercion it is not appropriate to enter into the contract by mistake it is not appropriate to make contract through misrepresentation and there should be no fraud of any type in the interactions another aspect is about the legal consideration a consideration should be legal and the consideration should be there to conclude the insurance contract in a contract of life insurance the insured gives premium as a consideration in return of which insurer undertakes to pay a certain amount at a specified contingency value of amount of premium is not important what is important is that premium has been given as a consideration to ensure liability of the insurer the contract of life insurance cannot be termed as valid contract without the payment of first premium in other words consideration is the price or the premium for which the promise that is the policy is bought and the promise thus given for value is enforceable so it is very important that in order to enter into a life insurance contract the insured gives premium and that is called your legal consideration in return of which he will get the insurance policy a contract's foundation is made of consideration a contract that is not legally enforceable cannot be formed out of an agreement without consideration the indian contract act defines consideration as an action taken at the promisor's request the promisor may request that promisee or anybody else do something or refrain from doing something in exchange for consideration the contract's consideration refers to this act of abstaining from him let us make the concept of free consent with one more example to help help us comprehend this in plainer words let us say mr x sells mr y his car for the sum of rupees 2 lakh mr y consents to pay him the sum and accepts the proposal this agreement becomes a contract with a legitimate consideration of rupees 2 lakh so here between the proposal and the acceptance the legal consideration is rupees 2 lakh that is the price to be paid for the car another important principle is lawful object the contract should be entered for some lawful purpose and the object should be lawful the object of life insurance contract should not be unlawful as per section 23 of the contract act the object is unlawful which is forbidden by law the activities that the law forbids and which is immoral and which is opposed to public policy or which defeats the provisions of any other laws so this is the first thing about which we are discussing about the fundamental principles second is about the insurable interest second principle is insurable interest it says that insurable interest is another aspect to form a life insurance contract it is presumed that every contract entered into is enforceable by the parties to it provided it is not illegal immoral or contrary to public policy the insurable interests means an interest that insured must possess in the subject matter of the insurance and which can be protected by a contract of insurance the insurance contract by its very nature requires some interest to be involved in the subject matter that is the financial interest insurable interests in life insurance may be classified into two broad categories that is insurable interest in one's own life insurable interest in others life what is this insurable interest in one's own life in delby versus india and london life assurance company 1854 it was held that a creditor may insure his debtor's life and the policy remains valid even after the debtor has paid off the creditor a person can take a policy to any unlimited amount on his own life and as many as times as he likes for his own benefit even though at the time he has the intention of assigning the policies to another person and 
Insurable interest in others' lives means, let us see the concept. Number one, the relationship between husband and wife. It must be presumed that every wife has interest in the life of her husband and vice versa is equally true. So, they can take the policies for each other. Second one is parent, child and relatives. A father can ensure his son's life in the name of the son and for his benefit. There is no law to prevent it. It is an essence and assurance by the son on his own life. The only thing is that premiums are being paid by the father. Sisters have no insurable interest in each other's life. Debtor and creditor, to make it more clear about this concept, a creditor may, include, may ensure his debtor's life and the policy remains valid even after the debtor has paid off the creditor. But where the debtor dies without making payment, which was subsequently made by his executors, the assured could not recover anything on the policy of his life. A surety has insurable interest in the life of his principal, that is a debtor. All the partners in a firm can collectively purchase insurance policies on the lives of each partner through its firm. In the same way, a trustee has insurable interest in respect of the interest of which he is a trustee. A surety in the life of his principal, a partner in the life of each partner, an employer in the life of his employee. These all are about the, they are having interest in each other's working and the life. Now, coming to the next concept, that how can a life insurance claim be made after the policy holder passes away? This is oftenly asked that if a policy holder himself die, how the claim should be made in that situation. So, we can say that the insurance company pays the nominee the full amount guaranteed in the event of the insured's premature death. The procedure for filing a claim is quite straightforward. As soon as the insured passes away, the insurance company must be notified. A claim form must be completed by the nominee and submitted with the necessary paperwork, such as a death certificate. Once the claim has been verified, the insurance company releases the payout. Occasionally, the insurance provider may decide to review the claim. The claim settlement process will require additional documentations and it will take a little longer time. Payment for claims may be made in one lump sum or by recurring monthly installments. If the policy holder passes away, the beneficiary can file the claim in three steps. Number one, death certificate. When you begin the claim procedure, you will be required to provide a copy of the policy holder's death certificate. Keep this paperwork on available in case the life insurance company requests a certified copy of it. Otherwise, the process may be delayed. So, be ready with the death certificate, original death certificate and few copies of the certified copies of the death certificate. Second important aspect is make contact with and notify the life insurance provider in an earlier position. That being said, we have a lot on our plates when a loved one dies. That being said, it is best to begin the complete process as soon as possible. And third important way out to get the claim is documentation or the paperwork keeping. Numerous other documents including the claim form may be required by the life insurance provider such as Aadhaar card, PAN card, death certificate and many more other documents. Before you begin the claim process, make sure you have all the required paperwork in order. Now, through these concept of life insurance that we are discussing, that what is the concept of life insurance and what is the scope of insurance, what are the kinds of life insurance such as the term insurance policy, whole life policy, endowment policy, money back policy and annuities and pensions etc. And what are the fundamental principles of life insurance contract formation such as offer and acceptance, legal object, consideration, no fraud, no misrepresentations. These are very important aspects of the insurance contract and how you can make the claim 
in the case of a life insurer dies there are certain formalities that are to be observed such as keep the documents ready inform the insurer and bring all the documentations to the uh, file that has been required sometimes the insurance company review the claim that you have made in order to establish whether the claim is properly made or not whether it is up to the mark or not it may ask you for additional documentations etc in that situations you are required to keep all the documents ready such as required documents as required by the companies at that situation so we can say that these documents are very much essential to keep the contracts lawful and when the insurer gives premium as a consideration then the party should be in a position to make it agreement and obviously life insurance contract when we say that it is a contract there are certain fundamental principles that should be observed and those are to be concluded in a better way so that the insurance life policy should be made applicable to both the parties both parties should enter into contract in a lawful manner and the both parties should be of valid age both parties should enter into the uh, policies which are not debarred by law and uh, both parties should try to give all the representations it should not pay any misrepresentation it the policy should not be taken by way of coercion by fraud by misrepresentation by mistake or by undue influence etc in that situation the policy can be said to be a lawful policy and when the offerer makes the offer that is the proposal the company reviews it the company go into that policy and thereafter it underwrites it and issue you the policy just merely by making a proposal and by giving the first premium amount it doesn't means that you have completed the formality and the insurance policy has been issued to you it is not like that by the landmark judgments that we have already discussed it is very much clear that merely just by issuing the policy the contract does not formed it is the company it is the insurer insurer who will go into all your proposal he will look into all the documentations and then he will underwrite it he will make the uh, all the formalities and then when he will issue you the policy only then you can say that that document that comes to your hand you can say that i have been issued an insurance policy and i am insured by the company so there are certain fundamental principles through which we can we can apply on all kind of contracts maybe it is your life contract maybe it is your general contracts these principles are to be followed such as acceptance i have already discussed with you then comes to your competency or capacity to contract capacity to contract means you should be of a lawful age in india it the adult is considered to be 18 years old so only when you are 18 years in yourself capacity only then you can enter into the contract with the insurance company you can make a proposal to that but it doesn't means that a minor cannot get the benefit of the insurance policies he can do so but under the guardianship or under the supervision or under the policy taken by the parents at that time in that situation is entitled to get the benefits of the policy maybe the father issues the policy to the son or maybe the son is taking the policy for any father both can do so but there should be a competency or capacity to the contract itself then comes the free consent that is parties must be ad idem this is very important aspect there should be a free consent in that uh, proposal and the acceptance if i am making you a proposal and you are not accepting it or maybe you are mistaken for what i have made the proposal or maybe you are under the coercion or you maybe you are under any undue influence in that situation that contract maybe that has been uh, come to a contract still it will be void or voidable at the options of the parties and if that contract is concluded by way of fraud in no case it can be a valid contract it is not voidable it is void app in issue so this is very important that the consent should be free from both side maybe it is the proposer maybe it is the insurer both should have a free consent for that for example if i am making a proposal and i am not clear in my terms and 
you have misunderstood it of something in that situation and you have issued the, the insurance policy and later on you observe that what are I have made the proposal that is under the mistake or misrepresentation of any fact later on it is observed in that situation you can repudiate the policy or the claim also at that time. So free consent is very important uh, aspect other than the legal consideration. When it comes to the legal consideration, see every contract is formed by the consideration amount. A very simple example I can give you that if I give you one pen and offers you that pen for rupees 5 and you take the pen but you have not paid any rupees 5 to me, this is not an agreement. I can get it back from you because the legal consideration is rupees 5 for which I am selling my pen. I am giving it to you. If I paid that pen and you have given me rupees 5, in that situation we can say the contract is concluded. This is a legal contract. Now I am not in a position to take that pen back from you and you cannot take that 5 rupees back from me. So this legal consideration is important aspect that is the parties must be at item and this consideration it should be in proportionate to what you are offering that will inform that it is a legal consideration. Legal consideration the law allows for that consideration. I can give you one example where the consideration is not legal. For example, I am contracting with you for the murder of C. Suppose I am A and you are B and I am offering you that I will pay you rupees 5 lakh if you murder C and if you murder C in that situation you cannot claim that 5 lakh rupees from me because that is not a legal consideration. It is not for any lawful object at that time. We are the, law, the lawful object if we discuss the lawful object means it should be lawful, it should be as per the law that has been defined by the for the time being by the governments you can say by the statutory law that is provided for that if you go against those lawful objects it is not possible to conclude the contract or it may be like that the other party repudiated it, it is voidable contract you can say and these are the principles through which we can say that these are certain fundamental principles which are to be observed. Why I am saying it is fundamental because there are certain specific contractual principles also that we will discuss later on. But these are certain fundamental, these are certain basic principles on the basis of which any insurance contract is formed and they must be complied with. That is your agreement and offer and acceptance between the parties and that should be in a proper way uh, that should be communicated to each other and then there is a competency the party should be competent, they should be of uh, age, that should be of adult age uh, fixed by the government in country or they should be of uh, sound mind you can say, not unsound mind or the insane. In that situation, you are in a competency or contract or you can say capacity to contract. What happens when a person is of insane position but sometimes he becomes sane? at some point of time in that situation if it is declared that he is in a fit state of mind and enters into a contract the contract is valid at that time because at that time he can understand each and every thing at that time. So fixes when this mental illness comes it is out of the scope of this capacity to contract at that time. So all these fundamental principles should be observed these should be uh, followed by both the companies and the insured persons to get the benefit of the life insurance contract. There are various kind of, uh, as I discussed with you, there are various kind of insurance policies such as your endowment policies, child insurance plans. You can also secure for your retirement benefits, annuities plans and your term policies. Term policies are basically less popular but more beneficial for those persons who can pay less and mostly those who are prone to accidents, those who are in traveling conditions, they can insure themselves for crores of rupees by paying some thousand rupees for each year. The only the negative point is that this premium that you have paid it is not returnable. It will expire 
as soon as the policy expires and for the next year you have to make new policy for that so you have to get renewed it this is the term insurance policy and also i told you that for retirement benefits there are now new plans where you can make the policies you can enter into those policies and you can you can deposit certain fixed amounts in a particular period and after retirement benefits you will get it as a by way of pensions that the company gives you for that and uh, uh, some policies like children plans etc it provides that at the appropriate time whenever there is a requirement for their marriage or for their education you will get some definite amount that has been discussed that has been contracted between both of you in that situation you need not to worry and in that situation you will get that definite amount and you can keep your worries aside and you can work you can pay attention to your works etc in that situation these policies are very beneficial to us and but these the only condition is that when these all policies maybe it is endowment plan maybe it is term plan maybe it is your uh, child plan maybe it is your retirement benefits there are certain fundamental principles that are to be observed only then the contract is concluded life insurance contract is concluded or any other general insurance contract is concluded if these basic principles fundamental principles are followed there should be a positive aspect about the insurance contract that if the insurer who assumes the risk who takes who bears the losses of uncertain events or the certain events for you in that situation you should not make any representation which is through any undue influence maybe you have taken the policy under any undue influence you have to mention it maybe it is through some coercion someone has threatened you to take the policy again it is not a lawful consideration at that time so this is the concept of free consent which i am telling you that consent should be free and it should be made between the parties who are competent to contract and there should be an agreement of the offer and acceptance for a premium that is to be paid that is called lawful consideration and that insurance too should be for the lawful object in that situations companies have some exempted clauses also in the life insurance policies such as it keeps the suicide exhaust uh, exempted clause in certain situations previously the companies do not pay any insurance amount if the person committed suicide but nowadays with the help of certain case laws also we can discuss that nowadays the companies has relaxed it but still it has kept a minimum time against which the policy will not be issued to say one year if the person commits suicide within a period of one year of getting the policy issued to him he when he enters into the contract the company may repudiate the claim as a whole because the person has committed the suicide at that time so there are many uh, situations where the life insurance policies are not issued by the companies at that time another example is your war risk at the when there is a war if you will go for the insurance policy life insurance policy maybe the company will repudiate it maybe the company will not enter into any kind of contract because that is a war like situation similar thing happens when there is possibility of drought or when there is a possibility of a uh, flood or when there is a possibility of earthquake or when there is full possibility that the fire will take place the situation is like that or the or the place is like that in that situation the company may not show interest to enter into the contract with you or it may keeps the premium very high at that time and that will be very difficult for you to pay in that situation so in last we can say when we come to the contract when we are talking about the fundamental principles of the insurance policy in that situation i am saying that these basic principles are to be followed while making a life insurance contract and safely again we can say that 
all contracts are agreements but all agreements are not contract when all contracts become agreements then it follows the essential fundamental principles that is agreement offer and acceptance second is competency or capacity to contract and when there is free consent when there is legal consideration and it is for lawful object when these all conditions are fulfilled the agreement between you and the insurer becomes a contract otherwise i will say that all contracts are agreements but all agreements are not contract this is what i have concluded about the basic or the fundamental principles of life insurance contract thank you for uh, listening to me and i'm sure that whatever i have told you that how the what is the scope of insurance law what are the kinds of insurance law how the insurance contract is formed that is very much clear to you through this lecture and i'm thankful that you patiently heard for to me a uh, very thank you to all of you Hello and welcome to this piece of literary snippet. Perhaps the most popular literary genre after novel is the short story. Sharp, compact narratives whose charm lies not only in what is said but also in what remains unsaid. Today I'll be reading one of the shortest instances of a short story that I have ever encountered and indeed the very charm of this particular story that i'm going to read out today lies in the way it abruptly ends it is an ancient tale from mesopotamia which has been retold by several authors among whom the name of somerset mom stands out uh, the adaptation that i'll be reading out is perhaps the closest to the one that mom wrote The story is titled in all of its adaptations almost as Appointment in Samara. Here is the story. A merchant in Baghdad once sent one of his servants to the market. The servant was supposed to buy provisions for the merchant, but when he returned, he came back empty-handed. Indeed the servant had all gone white and trembling with fear he told his master that he had met death in the marketplace When I entered the market the servant said to his master I was jostled by a woman and when I turned to look at her I saw that she was death I am very scared master because death looked at me with a threatening gesture Can you please lend me your horse so that I can fly away from Baghdad to the town of Samara and thereby escape death The master being a good man gave his servant his best horse and saw him gallop off to Samara to escape death Then the master himself went to the marketplace and confronted death. Why did you make a threatening gesture to my servant? asked the master to death. And death replied, "It was not a threatening gesture. Rather, it was a start of surprise. I was astonished to see your servant here today because this evening I have an appointment with him in Samara. See you in the next episode of Literary Snippet.